give a broad overview of the field itself. We're going to talk about why study gerontology specifically at VCU and what is really cool and really different and unique about our program and our department. We're going to talk a little bit about what career opportunities there are in the whole field of gerontology as a whole. Um, tell you a little bit about the specific programs that we have in the department. And then we're going to go over the application process and then the Q&A. But again, if you have any questions throughout, feel free to kind of jump in and put them in the text box or the chat box. So for those of you that may not know, gerontology, interestingly, is actually a young field of study, meaning that it hasn't been around but for maybe 50, 60 years. As a discipline, it's still relatively new, which means that there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to continue to shape what it becomes, what it is, how we define it, and how we practice it. In its broadest sense, gerontology is the study of aging, right? So it's the biopsychosocial spiritual study of aging. It's that real macro perspective about what constitutes the aging experience. The beautiful thing about it is that when we think about aging, we tend to think about it in terms of just older people, where aging is really about you across your entire lifespan. So I see the study of gerontology and the study of aging as the study of living, because it's about all of us, and it's about all of us throughout the entire course of our lives. Being a gerontologist means that you have this foundational knowledge that equips you to work either with older adults or on behalf of older adults or with family members or as an advocate. But basically what we're really interested in is making the world a better place to live and a better place to age. And that means looking at quality of life, looking at equity in and, and inequity, looking at those gaps, promoting well-being of all people across the span of life. And we do this through research, we do this through education, we do this through practice, um, and through the knowledge that we generate. And part of what's lovely about gerontology is that we are generating the knowledge that inform the best practices. So being a gerontologist means that we really have this very, very broad scope about how to apply the knowledge of biopsychosocial aging to actually improve lives of people. And that's gerontology in a nutshell. So while it seems really, really big, and it is, because we think gerontology can be in absolutely everything, it also means that there's incredible opportunities within it to carve your own path. And that's one of the most exciting things to us about gerontology is that you can come to this with any skill set, with any types of interests, and you can make a career path for yourself, whether it be business, whether it be psychology, whether it be social work, whether it be medicine, whether it be pharmacy, we're all aging and aging is relevant across all of those disciplines. So I think that's one of the most exciting pieces to me. So let me tell you a little bit about why you should study gerontology at VCU. And, and the real thing is because VCU is different. We are really different and we are really unique in the sense that we see ourselves as both an academic unit and a social movement all rolled into one. And let me tell you about that for a second. We have these two kind of parallel miss missions and you'll see our, our logos on the screen. Disrupting ageism is one and then aging into elderhood is the other. And we promote these as the hallmark of our program. So what this means is that we each need to spend some time thinking about what it means to age and examining how ageism manifests in our own thinking and our own behaviors. Um, that allows us to think about how it also impacts policies and systems and the things that we can do from an individual to a macro level to be able to address ageism within society. On the other side of addressing ageism is really broadening our understanding of elderhood as a unique stage of development. So to me, this means that we really look at what is more in terms of how we develop, what our roles can be, what miles and marker stone markers are there um, after adulthood. How do we contribute but in different ways? How do we continue to evolve and grow? 
So these are kind of the two foundational principles that we use, is that we live in a society where ageism is very deeply embedded and we need to see it, and that we also live in a society that doesn't recognize elderhood as a unique stage of growth. And that's the foundation for all of our research, all of our teaching, and all of our service. So it's that focus that makes us a really unique program um, and distinguishes us from some of the other programs. The other piece is that we just as much focus on your personal development as we do on professional development. And our students will tell you that being in this program can be life-changing, right? Some people even call it magic school because it, it it allows you the opportunity to look deeply within about what your own aging means to you. So there's a focus on self and a focus on reflection. And then there's the tools to also figure out how that applies to your own life, your own family, your own circle, your own community, and then extending beyond that. So there's a lot of joint personal and professional development that happens in our program. One of the ways that we do that is by being very learner-centered. So if you've been in, in the gerontology world at all, you hear this term called person-centered care and or patient-centered care, right? We, we all hear this, but very few of us really understand exactly what that means. So in gerontology for us at VCU, what it means is that we start by looking at the needs of each particular student. So that means that you get individual advising every semester, you get some one-on-one -on -one time to specifically talk about your goals, uh, what skills you need, what tools you need in your toolkit, what networking opportunities you need, things like that. Um, that learner-centeredness means that we have both part-time and full-time options. So you can take one class at a time or you can go full-time. It also means that we have both online options. You could do the program completely from a distance or in-person options where you can come into the classroom and more and more we're doing hybrid options so you can primarily be one student um, that's online but come in for certain lectures it means that we're just really interested in every student's well-being and their maximum success so we really work with you very individually to get you through the program in a way that supports your unique goals that's also something really unique to gerontology at vcu and then finally, we are extremely invested in career connections. And we do this by having a really, really robust system for community outreach and community engagement. We have a project that's called the Longevity Project. It used to be called AgeWave. And over years now, it has formalized partnerships in the Richmond region and beyond that take a look at what community needs are and how we as gerontologists, as students, as alumni, as community partners can work together to meet those needs. The beautiful thing about the Longevity Project is it's almost like this living learning lab. So it provides a ton of opportunities for students, both um, who are in their classes and those that are later in the program doing practicum, to work with people in the community, with our community partners in a variety of different roles to get that hands-on experience. And it's incredible connections for your career. So there's nothing like networking in the aging services network and who you know and the connections that you make. So these are the things that I think make us like really, really unique in VCU gerontology is from that ageism elderhood focus to the personal professional development to our very um, robust community connections that we have that help people develop their career paths and their skill sets. There are a ton of different opportunities in gerontology. So, and these are just some that we listed here. A lot of the people that end up graduating from our program will work in administrative gerontology. So, and Jen Pryor is gonna tell you a little bit more about our administrator program, our assisted living administrator program. But administrative gerontology could look like um, nonprofit administration. It could look like um, any kind of managerial type positions that's in leadership that are looking at interdisciplinary collaboration and coordination. It could look at federal or state level positions as well as those in senior living. So there's a variety of, of different avenues that you could take in administrative. 
administration happens to be a very well suited job for a gerontologist because we have that macro knowledge of biopsychosocial spiritual aging and because we have knowledge of lots of other disciplines and what the other disciplines bring to the table. So gerontologists can make for great leaders. There's also educational gerontology, if you wanna go into training, if you wanna go into education, whether that be community-based or whether it be within more formal settings like community college or university, lots of opportunity there. A lot of our graduates will go into social services or geriatric care management, those that wanna do more direct service and direct um, contact with older adults. Can, can bring that skill set together to support people either having their own businesses or working for other uh, companies. Entrepreneurial gerontology is probably the largest growing group that we have. And it's really exciting because these are folks that come from a variety of different backgrounds that choose to make their own career path. So we have had people, for example, in real estate come to us that will create um, right sizing, right? In terms of moving people to their next transition, their next location. We've had people in architecture that then focus on universal design. We have people coming from wellness and yoga that have created kind of ageless classes or run their own yoga studios. People in financial services that have opened their own businesses, done pre-retirement planning, people in engineering. I could go on and on. Um, and the beautiful thing is that there's going to continue to be a ton of opportunity in this entrepreneurial segment. There's a great book, if you haven't read it, it's called The Longevity Economy, and it's by Joseph Coughlin. He's the director of the MIT Age Lab. And I, I highly recommend that you take a look at it if you're thinking about some of these gerontology careers or opportunities, because he really spells out in there that we are just at the beginning of this longevity market, this longevity economy, meaning that there is a ton of space for innovation. There is a ton of space for us to have services, supports, um, businesses that look at higher needs of older people, right? We tend to think about gerontology jobs as just focusing on those support services, which is a lot about assistive devices or surveillance, and those things are needed. But think about the opportunities in supporting people's higher order, their well-being, their self-actualization. There's gonna be a ton of entrepreneurial opportunities that are there as we have more and more people getting older. And that's it, there's a demographic shift now. So more and more people are getting older, which means there's more and more opportunity. We also have policy and advocacy positions, and there is plenty of that right now. Um, I think that what we're experiencing at this particular moment with COVID is really shining a light on how much policy and advocacy work there needs to be. Um, you know, going back to what I was saying about ageism and elderhood, we are very much seeing right now at a societal level um, how ageism has been lurking beneath the surface for quite some time. And COVID-19 has kind of shown a light on some of that. And I mean that in several different ways. So if you think about the trending hashtag boomer remover, that's just one, okay? So there was a, a group that, you know, was saying, well, older, older lives are not worth as much as the economy is worth. It's just affecting older people. It's just affecting boomers. So the, the disease and this is essentially a boomer remover. That's one thing that we're seeing. That's one way um, that we're noticing it. Uh, on the other side of that is think about those pictures of spring breakers that we saw, okay? So there were all these pictures of blaming millennials for millennials not adhering to social distancing guidelines and being out on spring break. And there's a couple things about that. First of all, most of those people were not millennials. <laughs> they were Gen Zers. Millennials are mostly in their 30s at this point and probably you know, at home or working or whatever they're doing. So it, it's misdirected. The second is it just shows you the dangers of ageism, of these large stereotypes um, and how they impact people. So policy advocacy is huge. 
also be thinking right now about what's happening in our long-term care communities um, and, and the, the devaluing that we're seeing in them getting personal protective equipment um, of their long-term care staff um, not being acknowledged as being frontline workers. These are all policy issues, right? With ageism at the core of it. So going to be lots of opportunity to shape new policy and to bring light to that. And the current events, I think, are truly a catalyst for that. So such a great time to be thinking about gerontology. And then back to career opportunities, we also have this professional direct care. And we have a lot of people that will come to us from therapies, OT, PT, rehab, recreation therapy, awesome way to combine with a gerontology degree to be able to really focus um, on person-centeredness and needs of older adults. So lots of different ways that you can move your career path when you either focus solely on gerontology or you combine it with gerontology. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jen Pryor to tell you a little bit more about what value added of gerontology is. Thank you, Tracy. Um, so a lot of this really summarizes much of what you know you've heard already. Um, and this is gerontology has the potential to be a value add in general, but especially here at VCU because of all of the different things that that you heard about, which make us unique and different. So by going through a gerontology program, especially ours, um, you do get a lot of really great education and foundation in what it means to be uh, growing older and what it is not. We do a lot of myth busting in our program and we help you as a student and, and future elder to really understand what role you can play to help educate society in the, the myths and stereotypes that exist and help you to really find your voice when it comes to that. Um, we also spend a lot of time really understanding the, the role of the Aging Services Network in that, you know, the formal roles, the informal roles, all of the different pieces and, and partners that make up uh, the services that are available to us as we uh, grow older, things that are there that to help people who need assistance, but also to identify the gaps in those programs and to think creatively about strategies that we can use our advocacy to hopefully fill some of those gaps and, and maybe speak to some of those entrepreneurial um, interests that we have to fill those gaps ourselves. We also spend a good amount of time in our program talking about ethical decision making. In fact, we have a whole course devoted to helping students understand how to develop those skills and apply those skills both personally and professionally. And um, as alumni from that program, um, I will tell you that that is one of my favorite classes and one that I use all the time. And I think that, you know, when I see that in students now, when I'm teaching a course in a different area, they utilize those skills from that course to apply it to other course content. So what we're teaching is really practical stuff that you can apply right away, um, you know, in your courses, but also in your work settings and in your personal life. We also, um, have a, a course devoted to grant writing. And this is not an exercise in applying for grants. You're, you're out there looking for grant funding, uh, working with community partners to identify ways to help them secure funding for new programs, um, developing new programs with them, uh, looking for funding for research opportunities and that sort of thing. And this is a skill that you will, that will make you very, very, um, you know, marketable once you go out into the job sector to look for a career. This is a really, really sought after skill set. Uh, we also, throughout the entire program, uh, really have a good focus on developing our leadership and our teamwork skills. As gerontologists, as uh, Dr. Jenren said, we, we make good leaders and 
that's something that we know and so we really cultivate that within our program and we know that we're going to be working with a diverse set of individuals so throughout the program we really focus on how to work together and with others who have different ways of thinking different skill sets so that we can identify the best way to solve a problem and through uh, opportunities uh, connected to the you know longevity project and other uh, service learning opportunities we are really focused on this experiential learning we're in the classroom learning content but we're also out in the community applying what we know so that really helps you to um, you know, see the value in what you're learning and see how it connects to the larger community. And um, throughout this entire process, all students are building their network that they're going to have to lean on once you graduate. You will have mentors and colleagues that you've cultivated throughout this program in, in students that you had in class, the faculty that were your instructors, the um, community partners that you worked with and volunteered with while you were in the program. And so it's, it's a really great way to work on your future career from day one. Um, so I, I see a large amount of value of being in the gerontology program here at VCU. And um, I'd be happy to answer specific questions about some of these opportunities. Um, Tracy, you can go to the next slide. Um, speaking about our programs, um, we have two different um, programs currently. We have our Master of Science program, and we have a post-baccalaureate graduate certificate in aging studies. These programs overlap quite a bit, but there are some unique features to both programs. I'm gonna start with the certificate because it is the smaller of the program. Um, this is 21 credits. We also have opportunities for students who are enrolled in the MSW program, the Master of Social Work at VCU, as well as the VCU um, PharmD program. So uh, those joint programs mean that some of those credits come from their home program in social work or pharmacy, and some of them come from gerontology. However, you don't have to be in one of those programs to do the certificate. The certificate is available to anyone who's interested in enhancing their career. Um, many of the students we see in this program have had a long career in uh, a job that um, may already be in the in the aging services realm and they just want to really enhance their knowledge and skill set without um, committing to the master's program and to be quite honest with you many of these students then go on to finish the master's degree because they just have enjoyed um, learning what they have in the program so um, this, uh, this certificate includes uh, creating um, a special topics project um, that you would work one on one with your advisors to, to determine. And it's really based on you know, what you're interested in. It's uh, very similar to our practicum experience, which I'll talk about in the, in the master's program in that it's tailored to you specifically. Um, and the Master of Science program is our 30 credit program. And again, there is um, customization that you can do within this program. There are more credits here, so you have more opportunity to really tailor your, your interest to a specific specialty area that's either one that we have, um, that you might find on our website or the VCU Graduate Bulletin, or it's something that you create yourself with, uh, with your advisor. We do have one formal um, program, uh, our Assisted Living Administration Specialty Area Program. And this is for individuals who are interested in careers as licensed assisted living administrators, or even it applies to um, individuals who wanna seek that nursing home administrator license. Although I do need to mention that we are only accredited by the National Association of Long-Term Care Administrator Boards, NAB, 
I'm not gonna say that again. Um, so we're accredited by NAB only for assisted living administration, but the things that you learn in the courses in long-term care administration and finance and HR are things that you can apply to either career path. The, the great thing about long-term care administration in general is that there's a lot of overlap between the two lines of service. Um, and the unique features are really what you're going to get in your um, practicum experience when you do your AIT practicum. That's the administrator and training practicum. So we do have um, a number of students who come into our master's program with the goal of becoming a uh, licensed administrator. And I would say, you know, I, I can, say we have half of the students who pursue the assisted living license and probably half who, who pursue the, the nursing home license who are in this specialty area. And myself and another faculty, uh, Dr. Jenny Inker, we are the co-directors for this specialty area. We're both licensed assisted living administrators and we provide that mentorship and guidance to students in this program. And we also are the ones who are teaching these specialty courses. Now, with that said, anyone who, who is interested in, in HR, finance, and long-term care administration can take those courses. They're not closed to only the ALA students. So there's opportunities to explore within this program. If you're not sure uh, what type of career you want um, during advising, you know, that's a great place for any student to talk about the different course offerings, let us know what they're interested in, because that allows us to be able to create courses based on your interests and to guide you to the courses that we already have um, to let you get a sense of, of what that might be like. Um, as Dr. Jenrin said, we're very learner-centered, so we're really interested in supporting you wherever you are. And because a lot of students may find themselves graduating and then finding a career in any type of administrative position, you know, those, those HR and finance courses are useful to anyone who might be thinking they want a position like that. Um, with the master's program, we do have a comprehensive exam that you pass after taking all of the core content areas, the bio, psych, social, the ethics course, research methods. And um, once you pass that, you begin your um, field study practicum experience. If you're in the assisted living administration specialty area, that's your, your AIT program, which allows you to uh, sit for that licensure exam upon graduation. Um, if you're not in that specialty area, that practicum could be anything. Uh, I believe uh, during advising, we say design the perfect career for yourself so that you have a 600 hours to try it out. You can try out a couple of different projects. Um, every student's practicum is different. No one person does the same thing. And that's a really nice thing about this, this experience is that you design this based on your interests um, under the guidance of, of faculty and community partners. Um, with that said, both of our programs, as Dr. Jandrin mentioned, we're very flexible in terms of offerings. You can do this program online, uh, in person or a hybrid of the two. Um, we do offer uh, in person classes largely in the evenings because a lot of our students do work during the day. So if um, you have a job that, that's, that happens during the day and you want to come to class, uh, know that most of them are going to meet in the evenings. Um, if, if you can only meet for you know one class in person and one online, that's fine too. We, we do whatever's gonna fit your lifestyle the best. And you know that better than anyone. So we talk about that during course selection time. We offer rolling admissions. Um, so you can start in any semester. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that uh, when we go over the application process. 
Uh, again, we're very learner-centered. All of our faculty um, work this way, and there are plenty of career enhancement opportunities in both the certificate program and the master's program. Okay. Um, this, is a, this is a question I get all of the time, and some of you may be wondering that. So I just want to say that these, um, these estimates come from the VCU um, tuition calculator, and you can find that through the VCU Student Accounting Office, and I have the, the web link um, listed there on the slide. We're also going to send a follow-up email to anyone who's in, in attendance today with some links. But um, these are just estimates only. The in-state, out-of-state is determined by the VCU um, Student Accounting Office. Um, that is part of the application process when you fill out your application. Um, Full-time status uh, is a minimum of nine credits. That's about three courses. And um, part-time status is anything less than that. So um, you can make those de determinations on whether you, you want to be in uh, part-time or full-time, but here are some quotes for you there. Um, we do have opportunities to give students some scholarship assistance. And right now we have uh, an open application for fall 2020. Um, anyone who is enrolling in our master's or our certificate programs for fall can apply for scholarship funding, as well as anyone who's interested in taking our course, um, Gerontology 410, which is our intro to gerontology. This course is open to anyone. Um, so if you are currently a student at VCU and looking for an elective for your program, uh, this might be one you want to consider if you're thinking about applying to our graduate program uh, after you graduate. This is also open to anyone who is maybe not sure, um, not ready to commit, and you can apply as a non-degree seeking student and take this course. I will say if you take this course as a non-degree seeking student and then apply to our program, we can count this as credits that you've taken. Um, so it's, it's not that you would take this on top of also taking 30 credits of a master's degree or 21 credits of a certificate program. So we can discuss that more as you uh, consider your options. But um, in terms of how much these scholarships will be, we have, um, set aside up to four um, scholarships for anyone enrolling in our programs that will cover one full three credit course. And that's based on the in-state tuition rate. So um, if you are applying to our program for the fall semester, make sure you also fill out the, the scholarship application form as well. And anyone who's interested in 410, we have up to four additional scholarships for, for people who are interested in taking that course. And that amount is $300 per award. Um, so the application process is housed within the VCU Graduate School. You will submit everything to them, and then I have access to go in and get and get everything from them. They are the official record keeping of all application materials. So you would go to their website and um, click on the apply button and look for our program in the uh, listing. The application requires three letters of recommendation. We ask that these letters come from individuals who may be uh, faculty that have taught you, uh, maybe past supervisors in your work. Um, those are the best. Anyone who may have uh, uh, supervised you in a volunteer capacity, um, try to avoid getting letters of recommendation that are more personal, like from family members. We're really looking for people who, who know you in more of a, a student role or professional role sense. Um, your personal statement, uh, I always tell people that when you're writing your personal statement, we don't have a formal prompt here, but tell us your story. Tell us, you know, how did you get to where you are today? 
why, why are you thinking about studying gerontology? Um, how do you envision applying gerontology personally and professionally? Um, we're really looking to, to understand who you are and where you have been and where you are now and where you want to go. So, um, you know, put some thought into to those sorts of questions as you sit down to write that personal statement. We also require a resume or a CV. Uh, the, the transcripts from any um, institution that you've attended. For the master's degree, we also require the GRE or the MAT um, graduate examinations. However, um, if you already have graduated from a, a graduate program uh, or you have relevant work experience, you can request a waiver of this test and then it will be reviewed by the department and the chair. Um, so uh, if, if that applies to you, make sure that you mention that so that we can flag your application for review. And then the graduate school has an application fee of $70. We also are very interested in uh, meeting you all. And so we do have an interview process. So you will uh, be contacted to, to set up a interview either by phone or at this time we could maybe even do Zoom instead of in-person interviews. Um, but we really want to get to know you. We want to, you know, learn about who you are, um, get a sense for, for who, you, who you are. So you can get a sense for who we are. It's an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, and this should really be a low stress type of interview. You know, we, we aren't the, you know, type of department who, who, you know, really weighs one thing heavily over another. We look at all pieces of the application and this interview portion is really so that we can can meet you, to talk with you, to get a better sense of, of who you are as an individual um, and see how well uh, we all fit together because I think fit is a very important component of being successful in any program and we're very interested in ensuring that that all of our students will be successful. So we start that very early during this application process. Um, what's next? Oh, this is next. Next is we have time for questions. Um, as I said, we do have um, some links coming to you in a follow up email with some information and some of the stuff that we've talked about. But um, please uh, feel free to submit some questions during to the chat box and uh, Tracy and I will field those and I, I do see we have one already about the application process. Yes, it is exactly the same for uh, both of our programs. So uh, you'll doesn't matter which program you're applying to, you'll go through that VCU graduate school application. You'll make sure that you select the, the exact program that you want, whether it's MS in Gerontology or Certificate in Aging Studies. And then the only major difference is that, um, that test score requirement. That's not required for the certificate, but it is for the master's degree. Let me say one other thing, Jen, and thank you so much. Um, yes. If you want to apply to the master's program and you decide along the way that you want to graduate with the certificate, we can transfer you over to the certificate. So there's a lot of flexibility in that. Just as Jen said, a lot of folks who get the certificate end up then applying for the master's to finish that. It can also work the other way around. So you don't need to feel as if once you've applied for the master's that you are um, absolutely married to that option. If you decide, note the certificate is gonna meet my career goals, then we can graduate you with that. Again, because there are so many overlapping credits in those anyway. Um, who wrote The Longevity Economy? It is, um, uh, why am I blanking? I said it, Joseph Coughlin, C-O-U-G-H-L-I-N, Joseph Coughlin from the MIT Age Lab. And if you just look up Longevity Economy book, you'll find it, Edna. Yeah, I, I have the uh, audio book from, for that, so. Yeah, it's great. Any other questions? 
I tried my best to anticipate most of the questions when putting the slides together, but um, let's see, we could just. Um, so I'm not, it is the advanced standing MSW, is that the one that is a year long program, Rebecca? Because I know I had a I had a student who was interested in um, doing the certificate program, uh, the joint program with the MSW and um, and us. The challenge with that is um, you have to graduate with from both at the same time, and I would have to take a look at. Um, what we did make one change to to our course offerings, um, but it, I think it would still be quite a bit overload to to fit everything in. But you and I can um, talk by email, and I can look into what the the requirements are again. The student I, I met with prior, uh, the way that the courses were falling, it wasn't going to work. It was very difficult to fit everything in into one year. Sounds great. Yeah, send me yes. an email. My email um, address is right there on the screen, um, and we can we can look into that for sure. We can yeah. maybe that we could figure out timing wise, or if you start one earlier than the other, um, yeah. or yeah, we'll talk, Rebecca. I'd love to you know figure out what you're interested in. Absolutely. You got a lot going on, Rebecca. I know. <laughs> I like it. I know, it's just gonna be a powerhouse. <laughs> yeah, totally a powerhouse. Any other questions? Fe okay. Feel free to, to email us personally. Really happy to have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Any one of us, you can email Jen, you can email me. Um, you can look us up um, on our website. You can even email Aging Studies, that's the direct email, everything is fine. How do faculty support students? Ah, oh, that's a great question, Henry. So because we have, Henry asked how do faculty support students if any academic difficulties occur, we actually have several mechanisms to do that. We have a lot of departmental support built in and it's part of why we do the one-on-one -on -one advising, which is really more mentoring career development that we do every semester. So we are looking out for all of our students. Um, and as a faculty, we have monthly meetings where we kind of chat about everybody to make sure that everybody is well and to see what other supports we need. But there's also a second level of support within the college. And that is through our uh, Division for Student Success. We have now an, a, an Assistant Dean for Student Success um, who is really looking out for the well-being of each student and can provide resources and support. Um, there's also others. We have Andrew, Jen, what? what mm -hmm. Andrew Anderson, with the he's with the University Division for Academic Success. Yep. And he comes he's to great. orientation and yep. So we also have other places that we can refer students. Um, is there a possibility? Yes, Sonia, there is a possibility that it will move to completely online. We're preparing for that just in case. The instructor right now is designing it as a hybrid model so that some of it will be online and if the opportunity presents, there will be some that are in person. But if we're not able to do that, then it will still be completely online. Jen, you want to answer that one? How is ours different from other gerontology programs? Well, um, I, think, I think one of the biggest ways that we're different is that we have such a focus on disrupting ageism and developing elderhood. A lot of um, programs now, I will be honest, I haven't attended the other programs so I can't give you a 100% this is how they are but just the sense that I get from their websites from their, their course offerings um, you know I've talked to to some faculty and other programs is that you know they're they're not 
as focused as we are on some of the things that we do. You know, we, we all have a, we all operate from the same um, sheet of, of student learning outcomes, for example. However, the way that we approach those is a little bit different because we, we do focus on um, everybody is aging. We're, we're, we're looking at this as a much more integrated lifespan type of thing. And we're really focusing on ageism on both sides of the lifespan. Um, and, and really looking at that developmental phase uh, of elderhood. And I think that um, sometimes other gerontology programs can lean a little too heavy into the, um, uh, you know, the more bio side of things, the more, um, you know, uh, I'm not saying that they're not Concerned about uh, disrupting myths and stereotypes, but I don't think that they highlight them as well as we do. Um, I I did graduate from the master's in gerontology from VCU, and it was an amazing program when I went through it, and it's gotten even better since since I graduated. And I would do it again if I if I could, but I'm already engaged in other learning. Um, we've we're, we're all a, a, a group of lifelong learners in gerontology, so we're always constantly um, thinking and learning uh, about what can we do to improve uh, where we are in our understanding of aging, and how can we learn along with our students as well. So I think that that's the approach I take as an instructor, and I know that I've seen that in everyone else as well. Yes, Jay, thank you. Um, we do have a huge emphasis on service learning. I mean, a huge emphasis on being out in the community. We don't just sit in the classroom, like I said earlier. We, we're everywhere. We sit in the classroom a little bit, and we're out in the, the community a lot. So we, we're very applied. I also wanted to mention one other thing. Um, when Jen was talking about the field work and practicum and 600 hours, if you are working full time, we will work with you to figure out potential projects that kind of build off of what you already do. So we have a lot of folks that you know are already in the field, they're already working full time. And so the thought of adding 600 hours someplace else is very daunting. That doesn't have to be the case. It can be a special project that is at your place of employment that is kind of above and beyond what your job responsibilities are, but that will help enrich um, your company, your organization, and your development, your personal development. So it's not like it has to be someplace completely separate. The goal is for it to kind of you know, come together and be most useful for everyone. Any other questions? All right, well, we are gonna send you some links. Um, everybody that attended, we're gonna send you a link um, to a great video that we have that tells you a bit more about us. We're gonna send you a link to that scholarship form. Please, if you are interested, fill it out. Um, even if you haven't applied yet, we would just like to know that you're interested in pursuing the funds. We will send you the links to all of our websites and information and to the graduate school and the application. So thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to have spent some time with you today and feel free to email any one of us to follow up with questions. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good day, everybody.